has really made steady inroads into the practice of psychiatry. And consequently, the focus is on primarily drug-based intervention. How is it not moving? Which is not really surprising because of the kind of training that people in psychiatry are exposed to. The training is always theory driven and these theories are decontextualized. They are not contextualized into the kind of practice a trainee is supposed to negotiate once he finishes his formal training. So as a consequence, once you step out of the academic environs, you feel quite happy that you have gained all the wisdom and knowledge that is imparted to you by your teacher and you wear the academic hat very, very proudly. But hardly do we realize that once we finish our formal training in psychiatry, to borrow a <clears throat> phrase from one of my most favorite rock group, Pink Floyd, we are just another brick in the wall. So the brick, the wall also encloses us in terms of curtailing our explorations to discover other modes of understanding and knowing. Once we step out of the academia, and actually entered into the real world, we discover that, there are that the tree of knowledge has lots of interesting low-hanging fruits. Low-hanging fruits that can really expose us and introduce us to different modes of knowledge and knowing. What are the different modes of knowledge? There is this received knowledge, which is derived from our teachers and books. Based on this received knowledge, we evolve constructed knowledge to form templates of understanding of human behavior in distress, which we then translate into practice through a procedural knowledge. But the most important aspect of knowledge is the subjective knowledge, which is derived through experiential reflection, for which there is very little opportunity during our training. So what exactly is a experiential reflection? Experiential reflection is initiating a process of self-inquiry and facilitating the transformation from being to becoming the practitioner one desires to be. I'm very fond of this phrase, being and becoming, thanks to one of the most important teachers who influenced me, Dr. N.C. Surya, who wrote a very illuminative book called The Being and the Becoming. So reflective practice is, is essentially about becoming aware of our own assumptions, which are deeply ingrained during our training, to explore as to how these assumptions influence our practice and the need for these assumptions to shift and embrace change. And in the process, also understand the resistance to change of assumptions. And finally, change assumptions for a, most, for a more insightful practice. So re reflective practice in its essence is being open to new possibilities. There are three ways of reflection. Reflection on experience reflecting after the event with the intention of drawing insights 
to inform future practice in positive ways. The second mode of reflection is reflection on action, which involves pausing within a particular situation and then reframing the situation towards the desired outcome. But the most important aspect of reflection is reflection within the moment. To be aware of ways of thinking, feeling, and responding within the unfolding moment in a client interaction and responding congruently to the needs of the client. So the reflective act prompts one to look within, to understand the ways of thinking, feeling, and responding, and translating these understandings in interaction with clients. So the process involves addressing these issues. What particular issues seem significant for me to pay attention to? How were clients feeling? And what made them feel that way? How was I feeling and what made me feel that way? What was I trying to do and did I respond effectively? What were the consequences of my actions on the patient? What factors influenced the way I was feeling and responding? What knowledge could have informed me? To what extent did I act in tune with my own ethical values? How does the situation connect with my previous experience? And how might I respond more effectively to such situations again? So if we follow this process, it facilitates the emergence of what I would term as the internal supervisor which initiates a process of dialoguing within oneself while in conversation with the other. That ex facilitates exploration to newer frames of understanding. So basically, a reflective practice provides opportunity for transformation of perspectives. And reflexivity results in practical wisdom as the ethical and personal ways of knowing interweave together to form a unique and more meaningful pattern of knowing. That said, there's always a creative tension between comfortable ways of practice and potentials of exploring and enhancing it. But we must be aware that this tension also offers a learning opportunity. So reflexivity is a learning spiral that unfolds over time and enriches our understanding of ourselves and our response to clients' needs and expectations. Much depends on the windows through which we look and observe. Many of us remain trapped at only one window, looking out every day at the same scene in the same way. Real growth can occur when one draws back from that one window and explore other windows that await our gaze. Through different windows, one can see new vistas of possibilities, presence, and creative ways of examining. What are the prerequisites for reflection? Openness to inquiry, curiosity to learn, and most importantly, commitment to an ongoing process of learning. That said, there could always be bottlenecks in terms of becoming familiar with the reflective mode of knowing because of certain kind of emotional or intellectual rigidity 
that can seep into our ways of understanding, which primarily is a product of our training as also our personalities. So we, we need not lose hope. As Carl Rogers commented, the small child is ambivalent about learning to walk. He stumbles and falls. He hurts himself in the process. Of course, it is a painful process. Yet the satisfaction of developing his potential far outweighs, outweighs the bumps and the bruises. Essentially, the process of reflective knowing involves reflecting on your emotions, attitudes in relation to clients, accepting the client's ways of understanding, valuing one's, voice, one's own voice as a source of knowing, which can lead in turn to emancipation from what I mentioned earlier about the rigid and unexamined ways of practice, enlightening ourselves through reflexive learning, and most importantly, empowering through transformation of this insight into creative practice. Let me quote this from the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying. Sogi Aldrin Poche comments that we are fragmented into so many different parts. We don't know how, who we really are or what aspects of ourselves we should identify with or believe in. So many contradictory voices, dictates and feelings fight for control over our inner lives that we find ourselves scattered everywhere in all directions. Yet how hard it can be to turn our attention within how easily we allow our whole habits to dominate us. Even though they bring us suffering, we accept them for, <coughs> for we are so used to giving in to them. So reflection then helps to bring the mind home. Let me conclude by drawing an analogy to an umbrella. The umbrella is an umbrella of empirical and textual knowledge, which is provided to us during our period of academic training. Once we are equipped with this umbrella, we open it once we step into practice, which is often to protect or shield ourselves within the frameworks of empirical knowledge. But what we all we notice is that the umbrella doesn't remain static. The umbrella in the wind is swayed by gusts of experiences that have not been taught to us during our training, which overwhelm us in everyday practice. So the main task is how to hold this umbrella, the professional umbrella, steady through reflexive practice, offering solace to friends caught in the storm. So what are the important ways that we can initiate this process is through the Balin group, which offers us an opportunity from collective knowing of individuals reflecting in a group context. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Agaram, for that illuminative and uh, very interesting introduction. Um, and I feel that I can sort of take off from that. Um, so if people will excuse me whilst I share my slides, I'll go straight into my talk.
Um, the way we've designed these talks is that we will go through the three lectures and then invite questions. Uh, I would ask for the, quest the participants to type in their questions into chat so that we can take it up at the end of uh, these three sessions. Um, I'll also beg the indulgence of the audience because I am the host of the show and I might need to admit people in, in between. Pardon me for that interruption if it comes up. Um, the reason uh, I am talking about Balin groups today is because over the last um, 12 to 13 years, um, I've been more involved in psychotherapy, especially in group therapy. And I have a background in group analysis and in reflective practice in organizations from the Institute of Group Analysis. I've also been running Balan groups for uh, trainees and for, uh, for other doctors within the UK. And I've been doing this over the last uh, 10 to 12 years. So my task today is to talk about Balan groups. Um, most people would be familiar with um, with Balint. Now, he described Balint groups as something to develop in doctors a sensitivity to their patients and to their methods and emotional problems and to enable them to understand this in greater depth and to acquire skills to use this understanding for therapeutic effect. Michael Ballant was a psychoanalyst, as he likes to call himself, and also a psychiatrist, who along with his wife, Enid Ballant, and Ornstein, he developed a process of brief psychotherapy. Now he's less known for that today, but he termed it focal psychotherapy. So the short-term psychotherapies that we talk about today were actually introduced or thought of by Michael Ballant. Michael Ballant, as a part of the British tradition of psychoanalysts, was involved in setting up Ballant groups. Now, what these were, were groups where general practitioners would get together. And this was at a time in the 1950s when there was no formal teaching. After you concluded your, your formal training, there was no formal teaching. So it provided an opportunity for general practitioners to get together and to talk about their cases. So it was a form of case discussion, but Michael Ballant's aim there was to look at the doctor as the placebo. So he turned the focus of the discussion from the patient onto the doctor. And I'll describe this a little bit more in detail as we go on. These are two books that people might want to look at. So the first book, The Doctor, His Patient, and, his, and the Illness, was his classic book on Ballant groups. Later on, Michael Ballant ran his Ballant groups with his wife, his third wife, actually, Enid. And Enid Ballant came out with this book, The Doctor, The Patient, and the Group, Ballant Revisited, which is a more recent publication. At present, there are several balance groups in about 27 countries, and there's an international balance federation. This was first set up in 1975 with Enid Balland as the first president. There's also one balance group for French speakers, because most balance groups today are conducted in English. What started as teaching sessions for GPs has now become a staple in psychiatric education. So in, in the UK, for example, and, and most across most of continental Europe and in the US and in Australia, most psychiatry trainees and GP trainees are a part of a balance group throughout their career. 
Unfortunately, in the UK now, GP trainees are a part of a Baron group only when they come into psychiatry for their posting. It's also become a necessary component of psychotherapy teaching. So the first part of psychotherapy teaching for most trainees in the UK is to be a part of a Baron group and also to show their competency in having attended one. It has been used for supervision now. So for example, psychotherapy supervision is conducted as a balanced format across many countries. Band groups have moved from being just for psychiatrists to becoming a staple in psychological education, in training psychotherapists, in training psychiatric social workers, in training teachers, and in many other fields as well. Now, Ballant in India today, the first Ballant group that I set up, so I, so I run three Ballant groups in India. The first Ballant group that I set up was in Kannur in Kerala, and that's been running for 18 months now. And at the moment, I also run a leadership training group under the auspices of the IPS Kerala. Thank you very much, IPS Kerala, for that. And that has been now running for five months, where we're training uh, teachers in medical colleges to start Ballon groups in their, their departments. There's a Ballon group running in Chennai. Dr. Shivakami perhaps might be able to tell us more about that. And thanks to Matthew and to other friends, I've also been running a Ballon group in Bangalore. Um, and this has been running for more than seven months now. I might have left out other Ballon groups, but these are the ones that I'm aware of. And I described these to show that the Ballon format can be done in India, because there's a question that was raised whether in India, when doctors get together in a group, will they actually reflect and will they actually be able to participate in these groups? So what happens in a Ballon group? Let me try and describe this as best as possible. Ballon groups are run either weekly, sometimes fortnightly, sometimes monthly, and they consist of around six to 10 people. It could be up to 15. And there is a leader who's a trained leader. There is no specific agenda to the group. So people come in and a person is asked to present a case. What we know from psychotherapy is that we started with a one person psychology. So the focus there was on the patient. Gradually, we've moved to what we call a two person psychology, where the lens has turned from the patient onto the doctor. That is the beginning of Ballon Groups. So Ballon Groups, the focus is not just on the patient and the doctor, but it is also on the system. So sometimes in Ballon Groups, we talk about hospitals, we talk about services, we talk about the public. And all of these form, as we know, the constant stressors that most doctors might face. Hence, balance groups are useful in reducing stress in doctors. And this has been documented over several studies. So when people gather together in a balance group, as I said, the size is about eight to 12, we are still seated in a circle and there are either one or two leaders in balance groups. The leader starts with the question, does anyone have a case? And the, it is usually met with a silence. Now the silence is very uncomfortable initially, but what we should remember is that that silence very often is about reflection. The case that is presented is not the case that we do discuss in, in case-based discussions. It's a case that comes to mind and there's usually a reason for that case to come to mind. There is something about that relationship with that patient that brings that patient to mind. And hence, the case that is presented is a spontaneous one. 
The question that's often asked is what is the difference between a Barron group and a case discussion? As I said, there is no specific agenda. We do not look for diagnosis. We are not talking about management strategies, but we are looking at various ways to try and understand the doctor-patient relationship. So after a moment of silence, as I said, hold the silence, somebody comes up with a case. So it's, it's usually a very hesitant beginning. So I don't know, perhaps I was on the ward yesterday and I saw this 46 year old man. Um, and once the case is presented, the leader allows for a moment of questions. And the questions that are allowed are factual ones. So what is the age of the patient? What does the patient look like, for example? Or what was said in the first instance? These could be questions that are allowed. And once the questions are allowed and it takes about five to 10 minutes for the whole process, then the presenter is asked to push back. So in a virtual session, it could be a virtual pushback by muting themselves and turning off their videos. But Otherwise, they are asked to push their chair back a few inches and to, to be mute. There's a reason for this, because if the presenter continues to be within the group, the group will keep firing this person with questions again. What we want is for the group to speculate, to reflect, to imagine, and to be curious. Once the pushback phase is over, the leader ensures that the discussion remains on the doctor and the patient and their relationship, and perhaps a little bit more about psychological techniques. Once this is over, the presenter then asks the, the, the leader then asks the presenter to come back into the circle, and the presenter gives their reflection on what happened. So there's a double reflection that goes on. The question that's often asked is, are balance groups efficient or effective? When we ask this question, what we must remember is that balance groups, like psychotherapy, are very difficult to evaluate. So one might ask the question, are they efficient? One might also ask the question, are they effective? But what we must remember is that this is not a therapy group. So there is no specific outcome that you're looking at. There isn't a specific end point to this. Nobody gets better. But what is known, and I'll, I'll, I'll try and summarize this research in just one slide by using uh, two facts that are known about balance groups. The nature of learning in balance groups is inductive as opposed to deductive reasoning. Most of us, when we try and, and, and understand um, a case, we use what is called deductive reasoning. Here we use the opposite, which is called inductive reasoning. Doctors often ask this question, what is the type of learning that happens and, and does learning happen in balance groups? Because there's no conclusion at the end. There's no summing up. The learning that happens is what we call immersive learning or what we call communities of practice. There is Particularization. So we are talking about a particular case. We are not talking about a general um, deduction. It's about a particular patient. It's about a particular relationship between a doctor or a therapist and this patient or her patient. The learner's mind is curious. It is about what I do not know, what is not said within the group. There are because we are all vulnerable to emotions and hence to hurt, we must be careful about what goes on within the group. It is about the emotional availability of the, of the presenter or of the doctor and having a vocabulary for and to be able to recognize and name these emotions. So it is finally about empathy and resilience and it is about the ability to tolerate uncertainty. So if one were to ask a question about the effectiveness of, the, of balance groups, then one could look at this word document to try and understand it better. So 
this from the research that was conducted, this um, slide came out. So there's, it is definitely reflective. You learn to tolerate uncertainty. There's a focus on patients and their feelings. There's also a focus on doctors and their feelings. It is about work satisfaction. It is about a greater need to be psychologically aware. It is about managing positive emotions and negative emotions. And in that sense, Allen groups can be thought to be effective. I'll conclude this with just a list of further readings. As I said, these two books are extremely useful. And the third is research on Ballen groups and on psychotherapy for uh, postgraduate training and for medical students as used in the UK. It was edited by Peter Schoenberg and, and Jessica Yakeley, who will be assisting us in any balanced uh, work that we'll be doing, we will be doing here. And this is just a reading list. So thank you all very much. And I will now invite Dr. Matthew Burgis to, to his talk. Uh, you will move the slides for me now, Arun, because you, you got it all loaded there. I, I will, I will just let me know when. Yeah, you can go to the next slide. So uh, thank you very much to Arun and uh, Raghu for giving this excellent background on uh, what this is all about. Um, and I just want to uh, remind people that there is a Google Doc link uh, which you can fill up at any point of time, either now or in time till 1.30. Uh, so that if you are interested in joining groups in future, you can, uh, you know, we know to send mails to you. Um, can you hear me all, all right, Arun? Yes, Matthew, clearly. Okay, right. So my job in the next uh, 10 minutes or so is to tell you how Barron groups might be used in the supervision or in the uh, conduct and practice of psychotherapy. Next, please. Uh, so what is supervision in psychotherapy? When you talk about supervision, you are basically talking about your work, the work that you did to another possibly more experienced colleague or many times a supervisor. So this supervisory input enables the therapist to get an overview, like a bird's eye view from the top, a different view, an alternative view, and a fresh look at uh, the whole thing from an uninvolved or a so-called neutral person or a neutral people in the group. This supports the therapist's thinking and work experience. And you notice that I've put the plural therapist. And I put this because it's not just the presenter who gets understanding, but even the other therapists and supervisors in the group get a different thinking and experience. It enriches the experience that you have and that enriches, no, please go back. It, it enriches the experience of the work that you do as a therapist and the work that you do as a supervisor. And in this process, in this group, uh, all the therapists develop, a, develop further skills and understanding. Next, please. Next, Arun. Yes, and I'll beg the indulgence of people that I keep admitting others. Sorry. Okay. No so I just want to talk about how you could supervise psychotherapy using balance groups. As Arun mentioned, balance groups are done uh, in a group, usually peers or with a supervisor and discussions going on. It can be done for individual therapies, regardless of whatever school you practice, whether it is psychodynamic or behavioral or anything else. 
And as Arun mentioned, uh, you can even use it not just for therapies, but you can use it with general practitioners, teachers, and so on. An alternative way of the reflective practice has been used in family therapy, uh, called differently as the reflecting team, especially in the Milan School strategic therapy. And you also have another brand, brand of family therapy, which is called the consultative family therapy, where people, therapists, bring to the group um, difficult problems when they are stuck in family therapy. So their uh, supervisor sits and talks about the system and how the system is functioning and how you could get unstuck. It's also been used in various chronic conditions where you do therapy, like for example, in psychosocial rehabilitation. And of course, as Arun mentioned in group psychotherapy supervision. Next, please. I spoke in the beginning about uh, this model and I, I told you how the psychotherapy training program, when it started off in 1983 um, by Professor Agram and Professor Shamsundar, was in the format really of a balanced group. Um, I think one of the first um, people who underwent this training were my uh, colleagues, uh, Sanjeev Jain and, and Shekhar Sheshadri. Um, I didn't get this because I, had, you know, they, they didn't do it for the direct MD group. But I think the next year or so, I think Arun Kishore and other people got this program. So there was a group of faculty therapy supervisors. At that point of time, I think there were 10 and later on 15. Uh, there were these students the MD residents were allotted to one supervisor and the supervisor would have regular weekly supervisory sessions with these uh, four or six or more students. The interesting part is that the same group met throughout the training period for three years. And so you could see how this would actually help in growth and development of this group and also some growth and development of, of everybody's own um, psychological being. The aim of the group was to focus on processes rather than the techniques or the schools, because we know that in subsequent years, many supervisors were adopted maybe cognitive behavior therapy because they were more familiar or attuned to that. And in addition to this meeting that occurred usually on Tuesday evenings at 4 or 4.30, the supervisors also met once or twice a month, sometimes to discuss administrative issues, but other times to discuss the, their own therapy cases or the supervision that they did. I'm just giving this here because this is a model that has actually uh, worked for almost 40 years. And this is a model which is quite unique to any other program that is there in the country. And I think this is an easy model for anybody to use in their own training because it is fairly easy to use and it's probably very effective. Next, please. So are balanced groups useful? And how are they useful? Essentially, as the two earlier speakers mentioned, it allows you to reflect on the therapy that you did or the therapy that you're going to do. It helps you to reflect on the therapist-client relationship. And you learn a lot of psychotherapy, and this is available from the literature that you learn better communication skills, you learn to better formulate, and you learn different therapeutic concepts by this group. And as I mentioned before, it's not just this one person learning, but there's a group of these five or six people who are learning all these things. In addition to this, because of reflection, you get a systemic view of the therapy that is the interaction between the client and, and the client's milieu, the therapist and the therapist's milieu, and so you get a whole holistic systemic understand of, understanding of what's going on. 
it's a measure of relief for the therapist because the therapist is in a safe space and the Ballon groups promise to be safe spaces and the supervisors and the leaders ensure that it's a safe space. It helps you to avoid burnout. And because you have a reflecting team of supervisors and peers, in some ways, it shifts the onus both for you and for the client to that of a higher power. So it's almost as if this client is in some ways remotely being kind of looked, looked after by a group of people who, are, who have the client's interest in mind. And as I mentioned, it, in general, it improves professional and personal development of therapists and the supervisors especially if you have this group going on for a long period of time, like for example, three years. Next, please. So what is the evidence that Balin groups work? Um, Arun alluded slightly to it, but the research shows that increases the coping ability of the therapist. It improves the psychological mindedness of everybody who's there in the um, balance group sessions. So it makes you attuned to this doctor-patient relationship and what goes on uh, in that relationship. It increases patient-centeredness. So here you're purely focusing on the well-being and the interest of the patient. And the, the experience that you share is the same that other people share, gives a sense of universality, which is usually present in most group work. The most important part, which I think, is that it, it revives the empathy with your so-called difficult patients. When you have difficult patients, many times you develop counter-transference to these patients and you kind of switch off or you get lackadaisical in therapy. By discussing your difficult patients in the group, it rekindles and revives empathy in the clients that you're seeing. And I think that's a very big component of uh, therapy, especially when you get stuck. And of course, you will know that it, you can understand the feelings of the, of the patient, the client, and yourself. Next, please. So who are balance groups for? Very simply, they can be used with any kind of postgraduate students, whether it's in psychiatry, psychology, social work, nursing, or anybody else. Um, so students who are in mental health. So it's good to have people who are usually at the same level. So people who have had the same kind of educative background in terms of number of years working with mentally ill clients. It can be used with many mental health consultants in practice. For example, your peers or in supervision of your own trainees. And as Arun mentioned, it can be used in the, with the medical professionals, with general practitioners, with specialists, internists, uh, nurses, other health professionals, and of course, school teachers. And uh, next, please. Uh, this is my last slide. And then uh, we will talk a little bit as we go along this day about balanced workshops and purposes of balanced workshops and the leadership training that we're going to do in the future. And, in, and in, in the future, if this is interesting for people, we will hope that in future, we might be able to form a balanced society in India. And maybe if that happens in future, join with the International Balanced Federation. Thank you very much for listening. And I think this is the time that we throw open for discussions from the floor. We have uh, finished now at 11.30. We have, I think, almost about 15, 20 minutes for a discussion from the floor. And we will also take questions from the uh, chat. There are more than, I think, 18 questions. Over to you, Arun. Uh, 
Thank you, Matthew. Um, so we've opened this for discussion. I think we have a few questions in the chat. Um, and so um, one of the questions was about, is Balint a psychotherapy? Uh, many books say it is not. What model does it follow? Um, and is it useful for residents doing psychotherapy? Mathi, did you want to try and answer that? Uh, go ahead, Arun. I, I didn't see that. So go ahead. I mean, I'm just looking at the questions. Um, so uh, uh, I think I'll take this question. So you're right, Krishnan, in saying that Balint is not a form of psychotherapy. It's never meant to be therapy. Therapy as such. But the, if you are if you're asking the question, is it therapeutic? I would say yes, it is therapeutic to the participants. Is it useful in, in teaching psychotherapy? I would say yes, because there is a focus on psychological techniques. There is a the beginnings of what's called a psychological formulation that happens in a balanced group. There's also beginnings of Psych psychological thinking, which I think is the purpose of Baron groups in general. Um, Dr. Ragram, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, see, Baron group emphasizes reflective learning. The purpose of Baron group is not to process that reflective learning at an individual level, to address emotional issues within that individual in a format of a therapy. As you rightly mentioned, participation in a balanced group can be therapeutic for the individual in terms of offering insights about the way his own emotions influence his practice. And psych we, as uh, Matthew rightly mentioned, we find particularly over the several decades of psychotherapy groups in uh, NIMHANS that this balanced method is very, very useful in psychotherapy training. Thank you. Uh, so th th there's another question. If we were to run, sorry, I just lost the question. If you were to run a balanced group for GPs, other doctors, would it be best for a GP or a doctor to run it? Or is it possible for a trained clinical psychologist to run it too? Matthew or Dr. Agram, would you like to? Yes, In please. fact, we ran a balanced group for general practitioners, which was initiated by Dr. Shamsundar. <clears throat> we ran, ran it every month on Saturday in a, in a clinic of a GP. And then once the initial part of the Berlin group, which we conducted was in place, afterwards, the GPs themselves continued that group for several, several years. So Anil is asking, is it, is it possible to run a group for uh, patients? I don't know. Uh, Arun, Arun Kishore, would you like to answer? Uh, I, I don't think this has been used uh, for patients because that, that would be more of a, a support group. Um, this is actually a support group, if I can use the word, the term a support group for doctors or for therapists. So as, as you see, the focus is on, is on the doctor and the patient and their relationship. Um, I've not heard of it being used for, for patients. There is a question here by Sunita, uh, where she's asking, can you highlight on some aspects of transference and counter-transference in doctor-patient relationship in the entire process? Sunita, maybe you want to unmute and ask this question, because I'm not um, clear about what you want to know about transference and counter-transference. Sunita? Uh, yes, Arun, uh, I have a question Am I audible, sir? Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, 
see what i gathered uh, from this particular presentation uh, when we as a doctor are handling patient some of our own past experiences may come up while giving some suggestion some therapy uh, that can be because of some interaction uh, which is occurring between doctor and the patient when they are communicating with each other uh, across the one table so many time our own biases our belief system also comes into a certain uh, you can say action or a process so uh, that can be also responsible for giving certain type of a therapeutic resolutions also which may be right which may be wrong which may have some other uh, outcome also so how we as a uh, therapist or a psychiatrist should take care of that because every time it will depend on a psychiatrist or that individual personality development the rearing practices and the uh, nature which probably has come up because of a certain environmental factors also so how uh, see there are multiple factors what i mean to say ki there are multiple factors which are responsible uh, for any belief system to develop so how we as a therapist should take care of everything and give a appropriate solution or a therapy to the patient so i think you're not asking it in the in the context purely of a balanced group uh, you, your question is probably about general psychotherapy uh but i would say that the balanced group supervisory format would help you to understand these transference and counter transference processes sometimes uh, you may not be aware of it because and you only might take some time getting aware of it and i think when you put uh, this presentation to the group uh, the group uh, might see something which you are not seen and may help you to understand Uh, the transference or the counter transference process i i don't know whether i am i answered your question but i can ask uh, arun or ragu to answer it better primarily the purpose of balanced group is not to focus attention on the transference that happens within the group setting see it is to make the uh, participant aware of the transference process that that is enacted between him and the client and which is brought out in discussion so that it is reflected on by the group arun any other further ads thank you uh, when matthew i think that that was most of that, that question um yes, i i hope we answered your question The, the the next one is about um is it preferred that participants have a similar academic background such as having done medicine clinical psychology psychiatric social work or can it draw advantage from a multidisciplinary point of view by integrating participants from different backgrounds this is about balanced groups either who or matthew would you like to The, the, the question is about whether we can have a multidisciplinary balanced group across disciplines of psychology yeah, yeah. please go absolutely. on absolutely we can have a multidisciplinary yeah. background absolutely right and that is the strength of the balanced group because people from different backgrounds bring in issues in relation to their interaction and with the patients and that is being explored in the group setting and that is the strength of the balanced so more diverse the group the better i think i agree with ragu in the last one year we have discussed this and our group in bangalore is actually quite diverse in the sense that it's got psychiatrists social workers and psychologists and uh, we also discussed that in future when we do training should we have separate groups for you know xyz so we said no it will be useful but i think one um, one rider or one thing to watch out for might be to see that they are all more or less at the same um uh, training or experience level so if you say have a student yeah. uh, joining a group with uh, all sort of supervisors then uh, the experience may not be so good i think so i think if they are all at the same level of experience in terms of practice and training uh, i think it will be really useful to have perspectives from other professions 
There's another question here. Um, so what is it preferred? Okay, that's answered. Um, the other one, I can I can read it out, Matthew. Um, so is it peer supervision or group supervision? You want to yeah. go, Arun? Um, it has, you know, balance groups have been used for, for peer supervision. In fact, um, in, here in the UK, we, we use it for you know, trainee supervision of their psychotherapy cases. There, we use a balance format, but the supervision is a group supervision. Now, now the difference and the trick there is not to make it a one-to-one -one supervision, but to make sure that the group is supervising each other. And this is done for senior trainees, for higher trainees. Is it, is it useful for co-trainees, that is trainees who've just started their, their career in psychiatry? It might be, but personally, I would prefer that the first bit of supervision is one-to-one -one rather than being in a group. But I'd, I'd leave it to the wisdom of Raghu and Matthew to, to add to that. Yeah, nothing else to add to what you just mentioned, Arun. Uh, just one comment, uh, Arun or, and Raghu, and this is something when we do group supervision, one of the things that I notice happens when you do group supervision with students, especially using the balance format, is that many times the, um, if, you don't, if you forget to strictly follow the balance format, the student who's presenting tends to uh, sort of look at the supervisor and look at the supervisor for answers and so on. So uh, it's important, as Arun mentioned, that it doesn't become a one-to-one -one supervision in a group. Yeah. It's and it's definitely not proxy therapy that you're doing with the uh, with the with the with the students. So what I do usually, and uh, this is something that I've done for many years in when I do group supervision, and I I do a pushback and I push myself back and say okay, it's just the students they're discussing it, you don't mind me, and I'm, I'm a little bit at the back. And then I come in and sort of direct the proceedings and see how the discussion can happen. So that is something you might want to keep in mind because when you do group supervision, there is a tendency for the student to look up to you and think that you are going to provide some solution to the difficulty that they're going through. Other questions, uh, Arun, uh, generally how long the brand so I can brand. Yeah, see, sure, sure, I see, quite often, sometimes in a group setting, people might feel a little diffident to share their experiences initially. And once they start sharing their experiences, a lot of their personal life's issues, their issues with patients, even though we focus on patients, personal emotional issues come into play. What we have found especially in Balian group for psychotherapy in students is once we identify that a particular student has some kind of emotional issues, we always indicate to that person that he can seek help, but not with the facilitator or the supervisor of the group. So Balian group, I feel, often sets the stage for further explorations beyond the group setting. For those who are inclined to proceed that further at the individual level. And that insight can, in fact, enrich the group processes also. I think there's a I question there are about. Three questions for Arun to answer. I think how long is the Balan group run? And uh, what is the end goal of the or the purpose of the Balan group session? As I understand, the goal is to facilitate. Um, where is that? The facilitate uh, reflection because there is no present object to how does the session flow and where is the leader trying to take the session? This questions by Sheetal and Manjula. And there's also one more question from Kalpana which says, does this also involve contracts as you do for supervisory process? Every member joining the group would have to consent to this. Um, Arun, could... and then you can and then and, and then Arshisha can probably take her comment on effective groups. Arun, um, so so quickly about uh, the, the duration of Baron groups. Um, there is no set duration. So so Baron groups have been continuing. In fact, 
I think the longest running Balan group has been going on for about 24 years now. Um, now, the, the, the question is about whether it's an open group or a closed group. So a 24 year group would obviously be an open group. So there'd be people joining, there'd be people leaving in between. Um, the, uh, usually most parent groups are run monthly or sometimes fortnightly and rarely weekly as well. The weekly ones are mostly for trainees and they're they are usually short lasting. They're there for about six months and then the whole group changes. So you, you could have parent groups running in, in, in different, um, different durations. The question about endpoint, that's the whole point of balance groups. There is no fixed endpoint. So there's no purpose in a balance group except that the case is presented, you reflect. The more you participate, the more you gain. And that's for all groups. Participation ensures that you gain from the group. It is about understanding group processes. You asked about the role of a leader here. So the leader's role is actually to ensure participation, to make sure that the focus is more on the doctor-patient relationship, the therapist-patient relationship, and what happens there, and not to deviate into trying to make it into a diagnostic strategy or a, um, you know, a management strategy. The leader's role Funnily enough, is uh, what's called um, you know the engaging the group and doing a bit of administration, which is sending out reminders to people to, to come in, making sure that the room is available, making sure that the time is you know earmarked, and that you know trainees or, or participants don't have to go off to attend to a case in between, so that the time is protected. So that's the role of a leader there. Um, would, would you like to add anything else? Uh, about are... contracts, Arun? This is a question about contracts. Does it involve contracts? No. So, so a balance group, the only contract is confidentiality and to allow participation and to allow other people to speak. Sorry, Raghu, you wanted to say something? Did, Raghu did wanted you... to say something? See, one thing I wanted to add is the need for supervision of the leaders. See, once you run a balanced group as a leader or over a period of time, I think there is also an important need for supervision of the leaders too. See, that itself is a process of self-reflexive learning for the leaders. See, many times we start a balanced group and in the process, the leader themselves learn, the leaders themselves become aware within themselves. And if there is a supervisory process that is in place, the learning curve of the leader is enhanced further. I couldn't agree more to that. And thank you for bringing up that point. Um, because I think that that, that, that is the, as in any psychotherapy, that's, that's a key. Yeah. Ashisha, you want to make your comment? I think it's used, or anybody else. I think all of you, almost 100 people here are all experienced clinicians. So please um, make your comments. And, and I think there are people who have been in groups would like to make comments as well. Go ahead, Ashisha, please. No, no, I was just going to add, I think Dr. Raghuram answered uh, that uh, more or less. That, uh, so I run uh, this monthly um, group supervision group and it's an open uh, group wherein we have a theme, but everyone uh, opts to present a case and we try and keep it as reflective as possible and not become like a interrogation session. What did we do? What did you do? Could you have done this better? So we try and keep it reflective. But uh, like what Dr. Raghuram said, you know, that um, the group is of varying degrees of experience. So even a senior's sometimes uh, end up learning a lot just by reflecting. Um, or for me, a lot of learning is about how I might have become complacent or jaded in some of the issues when someone with a fresh perspective, a junior comes in with a fresh perspective. Just reflecting on that, reflecting on our discomfort is something that happens. You know, how uncomfortable some might be in presenting something when they perceive that uh, others may know more. Um, 
and how that might have prevented them from presenting it in their workplace. So just reflecting on the discomfort, reflecting on what are the emotions or feelings that go through when they're talking about this case, why did they choose to bring this case? Uh, that's quite useful. And another thing that I think Dr. Ragra mentioned with the GPs um, is one something that I'm trying to do with a group of teachers is to ultimately make them self-sustaining. You identify a leader and then they hopefully can sustain that reflective model or a balanced model on their own uh, with, a, with the identified leader. So I think that's a very good model to have. If we could do that uh, in various settings, then we don't need to be part of that uh, leadership model all the time, especially if it's with a team that's outside of us. Um, yeah. Thank you. I think uh, there's a question about um, the, um, the links to further reading. We will post that in the chat in, in, when we take a short break. So people can copy that and, and understand that better. Um, there's also a question about the Google Docs. We will repost the Google Docs link here now so that people who are interested in doing any further um, training, um, as, as Matthew said, that the training is for either to be in a balance group yourself, which, which we will hope to, to provide, and also the training to become balanced leaders um, so that we can continue the process. So I'll post the Google Docs in the document, in the chat right now, and we'll post the other links in, in a moment. Um, may, may I ask a question? Of course. Justin, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you. And I, I think uh, it's been very informative for a clinician who's a physician with an ICU background. Uh, and, uh, I, and we were thinking of doing something of this sort, particularly uh, given our profession has a as a marginally higher burnout, or let's say, um, uh, all, all the things that would go with it, like depression and all, all that. And so we, we were thinking of doing it. But at the end of the day, for me, the Balin group was going to be a strategy because the group is struggling. I have identified the group as struggling group. It wasn't like how Nimhan started as, as, as something that they've just incorporated in the process overall. And that's that's one part of the question. The second part is that I, I see that majority of the speakers either, either are, are, have worked in the central institutes or or or, uh, or the government side or on overseas with the uh, NHS or uh, other other setups where there is likely to be some protected time because of the leadership. Uh, there is likely to be support for these processes uh, financially and otherwise. Uh, whereas in a private sector in India, where it is probably a little bit more intense for us. How, how are we going you know, for, for me, number one, I have to make a case for it. So for which I have to prove that Balin group actually is beneficial for my group. So the, the struck, like, you know, I need, the, I need to buy that time, like, you know, for two hours a month is quite an expensive process uh, from like, you know, private sector point of view. So if I want to prove that, and I need to prove that uh, then, I need to have a measure to say that, okay, it, it isn't just subjectively saying that they're feeling better. Um, and, and it is gonna be difficult to, to, to show the IC outcomes or let's say physician outcomes as a surrogate for the you know, balance group, which is gonna be a lot of difficulty. Is there a way that we could use, the, use some form of objective ways of you know, capturing the reflection uh, before and after? You know, to make it make it more, I mean, like you know, uh, uh, like you know, appealing to people because majority of the clinicians who are in the private sector in India, um, and and it is probably I thought a valid one. And I think somebody has already asked a similar question in in these lines. Thank you, uh, for that question, and I'm, I'm really pleased that we have um, somebody from a, a different specialty attending here. Uh, would Matthew or Raghu like to answer that question? The question, Raghu, I, I think you'll drop out in between. I think uh, a lot of people in private practice itself who are here, you know, Ashley, Shah, Ajit, they could probably answer this better because they they must be facing the same kind of issues that Justin talked about. That's one of the questions I'm not able to answer. So Justin's my husband, by the way. He works in ICU. 
Okay. And I've been encouraging him to uh, start, you know, Balint Group. But one of the things he, I think his question is mainly to say, how do I sell this to my fundraisers? You know, how do I sell this and make it like an objective thing? Tell me some objective measure that I can show them that then they will be convinced to um, give me two hours from of my clinicians. I think Dr. Raghuram would. Yeah. Raghuram, would you like to? That's a... <laughs> Objective measure to convince the fundraisers is a difficult pro proposition, not just for animals, <laughs> but also for any kind of psychotherapy, right? So that said, there is a felt need among practitioners to share difficult issues and their problems, uh, the kind of issues that come up with their patients, as can be assessed by the plethora of WhatsApp groups. Right? I'm part of a couple of them in which, see, when you start practicing, you feel that you're alone. And when you come up with a lot of issues that you're not able to handle, you reach out to peers. So WhatsApp group at some level is a kind of a group reflective activity, which is already in place. Balance group gives it a structure. Whether private sector will fund that or not, I'm not very sure. Private sector, sorry to say, is profit oriented, right? So whether they see profit in Valiant Group, the only profit in Valiant Group is experiential learning, which cannot be marketed. Just to add on, uh, Justin, uh, many years ago, uh, Dr. S K J Prakash, Shamsundar, Ragram and um, Achar and various other people, we used to have a group running in the Elama Dasba Hospital, remember, yep. in the yep. evening. So we all used to meet and for many, many, many months. And then, so we just made the time and the rest of them are all in practice. I think only Raghu, uh, Shamsun and I were from Nimans. The rest of them are all in practice outside. And we just made that time in the evening to do this. And I think just to answer Justin's question again, in another way, this whole need in the last one year has come out of the COVID pandemic, really. Yeah. And, and because of the, uh, the kind of stress that people are facing and doctors are facing, and then people feel that there's really no place for people to engage and have a discussion. Uh, and I think that's how, uh, I mean, at least our group in Bangalore was born like that, if I'm not mistaken. I think yeah, we want because you're in you're in practice and you know this is something that or anybody else who's in practice. Thank you, Justin, for asking that question. No, no, I have uh, as as a, uh, if, if I may, uh, I have act, we have actually started the process of uh, collecting all these burnout scores from from most of my residents or uh, there we had six states of India and ICU doctors both who were in training and those who are like you know, practicing, and we have realized that you know, uh, between two and five years from their their uh, their start a bit, within the first five years of their training period before they become independent practitioners, somehow the resilience seems to be far low than you would expect uh, based on all these mass lack scores and uh, other scores that we have done at that time. And the, unfortunately, COVID came and then we couldn't follow up with that by by starting to try to look for an intervention. And, and after my multiple readings and discussions, and uh, I thought you could use Balin Group as a way, like, you know, run, run a Balin Group for six months and do the scores again, um, was one of the ways that we were trying to see if that would work. And uh, I wanted to see if in, any of the seniors probably, rather than, I know it's a reflection towards resilience, and obviously resilience can be measured. So is there a good way to see if the Balin Group could be measured that way? Yes, uh, just, so there's, there's lots of information and um, evidence from the UK uh, within the NHS where they use um, balance groups for resilience training to reduce stress, to improve retention of doctors within services, um, to improve, to, to reduce um, things like, you know, suicidal thoughts and suicidal rates within doctors. So, so there, there is some evidence, and, and if you want that evidence, that's there. But how you want to make a case to your organization, I guess that, that that's something you would best know. 
Um, I think we've come to the end of our time here. Um, many thanks, I, many thanks, yeah. So, is um, Ajit wanting to say something? Ajit? Yeah, Ajit, I think he's got the camera on. Okay. Oh, hi, Ajit. We, we can't hear you, Ajit. You're, you're yeah. muted. So, uh, I think uh, Justin's first word was burnout. And I think Ballot Group can go a very long way in reducing uh, the intensity and the occurrence of burnout. I think that's a very important facet. And I, uh, I have never belonged to any group. Uh, I have these Tuesday forays, Tuesdays with Mori with uh, Atesha. And we've been talking about starting a Ballot Group. And then she told me that one exists in Nim Hands with Matthew running it, but we never formally got down to it. This was, uh, I think this was way before the pandemic, by the way. And uh, we had Raghu with, uh, you know, uh, Raghu was, was one of the leaders over there. We had a small group of psychiatrists and psychologists we'd meet, and it has it had, had its own dynamics. We were all reasonably close friends. Uh, some perceived a hierarchy there and dropped out. About six of us have continued, and we don't mind the hierarchy when it uh, becomes manifest. It started out to discuss our uh, experiences not necessarily our problems, our experiences in practice. But slowly it become, became much more of a social gathering which we all quite treasure. And uh, we miss each other if we don't meet like, like it happened in the pandemic. But still, some features of the balance group do obtain over there. And I think that does a lot of group. And I think the isolated practitioner, whether he's a GP, whether he's a physician, whether he's a, a mental health professional, needs this kind of a support group where we get together, talk about processes, don't be judgmental and don't dismiss people because they have certain experiences, values that do not tally with yours. Take it in your stride, I think is a very important passage. Uh, Arun and Raghu, in, in, in the course of your presentations, there was this, and Matthew also, the idea that it should be homogenous. I, in the, I joined the Bangalore Ballet Group and I feel like the old boar in Animal Farm. Uh, so I, I uh, I've been reassured by our leader, Arun, that no, no, that doesn't make a difference. The fact that you are 30 years senior to most of them does not make a difference. And I've enjoyed, I've also learned from this, this group. So I think the homogeneity of a academic background does help, but the uh, homogeneity of years of experience is not that essential as how I'm beginning to see it. Uh, <clears throat> since Arun, since you mentioned about Peter Schomburg, one of the important learning I had during my I mean, early days in the man's as a faculty was from his mother, Elizabeth Schoenberg, who conducted therapeutic community in Pavilion 4 for more than one and a half years, which involved group meeting every day, morning and evening. That a very important learning for me to introduce me to the kind of issues that come up with patients, patients and nursing staff, patients and doctors, and discuss them in a very open fashion. So whenever Peter Schoenberg is mentioned, I always recollect his mother very, very fondly. Thank you, Raghu. I didn't know that about uh, Peter's mother. I'll certainly mention it to him when I see him. I think we've come to the end of our time in this particular session. Um, is that right, Matthew? Should, should we move yeah, on? Yeah, I think we're supposed to be of, uh, just overshot a little bit, but we take a few minutes bio break, I think, and then we come back and do a demo balance group. Is that what we're going to do now? There are a yes. couple of questions. I don't know if we've addressed should, all of them. Do you want to address them later? Because we because we will we have actually gone five minutes over time, and we do the group, and we have we still have another more than half an hour in the end to address questions. So people can keep posting in chat and also people can answer the Google Docs if they want to now, whatever they like. Is it a five minute break, Arun? Uh, yes, I think a five minute break. Uh, it's more of a comfort okay. break. We'll yeah. back. And also while we reconvene our group, isn't it? So again, a request is that uh, what we have planned to do is that the group that has been running in Bangalore members are present here will convene into the group and I would request all the others to um, mute their cameras. That will happen in uh, about five minutes. Thank you.
So it, it is that group and uh, she will come in. She will be joining us in that group. So see you all in five minutes. Um, So, Sabina, Shiva, Matthew, Ashlesha, Ajit, Manjula, um, Sabina, Sabina is here. Yes, Sabina, Priya is here. Priya is, so she Priya is there. Yeah. yeah, I'm there. I'm having a problem with my camera. I'm there. Okay. Uh, Ratna? Sandeep and Bino. These are the people. Bino, are you here? I don't see him. No. He, he anyway, will we'll, yeah. we'll join in five minutes in any case. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 